death. We love him, we hate it. Like Persona 6, it's just inevitable. That's why we make so much media around it, a lot of it mostly romanticizing it. And gaming is no exception. Games like Persona 3 thrive through the themes of accepting death. However, few games commit to this message. I say this because it's very common to see moments where the protagonist or some random character is brought back to life. Case in point, Smash Bros Ultimate. You see, Smash has a ton of characters who have pretty much defeated gods. But how many of them have actually been able to make it in one piece? Surely there's no way these people could still be alive after the events of their respective games, right? This is going to be a very interesting kind of topic. Getting the answer whether or not a character has actually died in a franchise isn't super niche, but even then I had to do a ton of research. I may be super knowledgeable in the Smash series, but it's been a good few years since I've been very passionate about it. Whatever the case is, let's set some ground rules. When I say they died, I mean they actually died within the events of the story. So no, Mario accidentally hitting a Goomba doesn't count. Characters who have died in a different iteration of their games will have a completely new tier called Died in an Alternate Universe. Same goes for the characters who have died but shortly resurrected. Trust me, there is going to be a lot of these because the writers for these games love to swing the logic out of the window. And last but not least, characters who don't have a definitive ending to their story like Steve, we'll get to them. Also, major spoilers for just about every franchise represented in Smash. This includes games like Xenoblade 1 and 2, the Bayonetta Trilogy, Final Fantasy 7, Fire Emblem Awakening, and all these other games. Also, we're just covering games here. No movies, no comics, no external pieces of media these franchises produce. With that said, let's begin. These are the Smash Bros characters who canonically died. Before we begin, however, if you are really enjoying this production and want more Smash related stuff, be sure to subscribe. Anyways, let's see who we got. First up, it's... First things first, let's talk about who definitively dies. No ifs and or buts. Since a lot of the characters here have died before their successor or a new entry, we're going to be using the timelines for each of these franchises. By this logic, it means Ness is dead by the events of Mother 3, Dark Samus dies in Metroid Prime 3, Ridley dies in Super Metroid, and while you do fight him in Fusion, Other M, and all these other games, they're either a clone or made from his remains or just a robot. Simon and Ripter have their game set in centuries before the latest game in the Castlevania series, that being Dawn of Sorrows, set in 2036. Snake? I mean, have you seen the ending for MGS4? Mega Man is presumably scrapped between the events of the Classic and X games. Like, there's serial mention of him, so it's very possible he's either scrapped or in a state of powered off. Mark and I- Mark? Why do I keep saying Mark? Mars and Ike are pretty much ancestors in the events of Fire Emblem Awakening. I included Ike in this category because on one of the Spot Pass characters, it is claimed to be a descendant from him. Take it as you will, but let's just say that Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn are set in the same timeline as Awakening, which in itself is the most recent in what I'll call the Shadow Dragon timeline. I say this because the thing about Fire Emblem is that there's different games set in different timelines of their own. Do you know how Final Fantasy has different entries like 10 and 13 with their own characters and stories? And with Within those entries, they have their own sequels and whatnot. Yeah, that's sort of how Fire Emblem operates as well. Also, this is an incredibly hot take, but Bayonetta, or should I say, Sarisa, she's dead. It really pains me to say this as a Bayo fan, but all the signs are there. We see all of the other versions of Sarisa from different multiverses killed in that big endgame climax. The Bayonettas who appeared in the last two games, who also state that they are the remaining Sarisas alive, sacrifice their strengths with ours to become one being. While our Bayonetta does actually defeat the main villain, Singularity, it doesn't stop one of your demons from killing you after the metal keeping him under control breaks. I mean, did you see what happened to Sean in Bayo 2? Now I know that there is the slight chance she can survive and make it back, but looking at the kind of direction the franchise wants to go, I wouldn't hold my breath on it. In conclusion, these are the characters who just died. I also forgot to mention the Dragon Quest protagonist, which correct me if I'm wrong, but this is their respective game they all die in. So yeah, on to the next one. Now that we got those ones out of the way, let's get to the real complicated stuff. These are the characters who have died under a different iteration or timeline. These ones will require a bit more of having to explain the different timelines and events that happen because, oh boy, we're gonna need it. Let's start with a simple one, Ganondorf. Is he dead? Are there multiple versions of Ganon that still exist out there? Well, yes and no. 
To put it simply, Ganondorf is essentially an incarnation of the Mises' hatred. The Mises himself is the main villain and also known as the Demon King, who you fight in Skyward Sword, aka the first game in the Zelda timeline. Oh yes, we're going there. So basically, while you can't get rid of the Demon King, you can in fact kill his incarnations, Ganondorf being one of them. To keep this both interesting and simple, we're just gonna take a look at the instances where this version of Ganondorf has been killed. To understand this, let's take a look at the Zelda timeline. Don't worry, this will be quick. Let's use this graph for reference. So the way it works, we start here, at Skyward Sword. And for a good while, the timeline stays pretty consistent with just one route. It's until Ocarina of Time when we had to split it to three different parts, all of which run parallel to each other. There's a falling timeline where Ganon actually defeats the hero. This one spans from A Link to the Past all the way to Zelda 2. By this point, the Ganondorf we associate with Smash is long gone and or sealed away until a new hero defeats them. The famously named Child and Adult Era are the ones where the hero is successful. The Child Era has Zelda sent Link back in time to when he was a child. In here, Link, also known as the Hero of Time, warns Zelda about Ganondorf before he can pull a fast one on them, and the new hero stands up against them. This takes us from Majora's Mask all the way to Twilight Princess, where a new Link actually does kill him but it's also implied that he was reincarnated, which he is in Four Swords Adventures. While we could classify this as he cheated death and got brought back to life, he actually didn't. Rather, I'll call this a new Ganon since he doesn't seem to have the same memories as the one we previously defeated. But wait, there's more. You see, we still haven't talked about the adults era. So you know how Link warns Zelda about Ganondorf and his plans? Yeah, once he gets sent back in time, he's no longer there. Since there is no hero now capable of stopping him, a few centuries later, Ganondorf breaks free, and to prevent him from taking over Hyrule, the area becomes flooded. From here is when we have the events of Wind Waker, and all of these other games, where a new hero does in fact kill Ganon, and I mean dead for real this time, like no reincarnation. He straight up gets stabbed in the face, turned into stone, and drowned alongside Hyrule. That's one way to kill him. As for Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, this is where things get interesting. You see, these games are set way far into the future from whatever has happened in these games, to the point that it's just completely irrelevant. But for those curious, the Ganon we fight in either of these games is not the same as the one in here. So what's the answer in the end? While the Ocarina of Time Ganon is long dead, Ganon and Demisa's hatred is constantly reincarnated into new forms. Same goes with Link and Zelda. While they definitely still were alive in the adult and child eras, by the time Breath of the Wild begins, we are already so set far into the future that it could be put in a history book. These new ones are just new iterations. In other words, Ganondorf is dead, A Link Between World Zelda, which is the one in Smash, is also dead, Toon and Young Link are practically ancestors, but Link is still alive and kicking since technically he is the one from Breath of the Wild. But if you want to be really technical, you can say that Link cheated death thanks to the Shrine of Resurrection, where he was asleep through hundreds of years up until the events of that game. Whew, alright, that's one convoluted franchise done. What's next? Oh god, not you again. Alright, so, in Fire Emblem's case, for the most part as mentioned, a lot of its cast are technically dead if we base off our logic from Awakening. Characters like Corrin, Byleth, and Roy are either set in a different world, alternate universe, or they have their own standalone story. Meaning, it's very likely they're all just still alive. It's with Lucina, however, where things get insanely complicated again. Not even 5 minutes in, we get shown Robin kill Krom in a fight between Baladar, one of the main villains in the game. This is later revealed that this and pretty much the end of the world happens in Lucina's timeline and is trying to help change the outcome. So by that logic, you can say that Krom technically died in a parallel universe. As for the others, it's all very vague in the end. If you decide to sacrifice yourself to defeat the main villain, it's implied that Robin did die to save the world. Although in a post credit scene, Krom picks up a random person out in the field, just like how he met Robin. This led many to speculate that it could in fact be him. As for Lucina, while nothing is really said about her, it's very likely she's either in the same timeline as Krom, but now looking for a new purpose for her to follow. This is especially noticeable by seeing the outcome she has for who she takes as her spouse, with most if not all of them being about following the goals that they have. By this logic, it's safe to assume that pretty much everyone in Awakening featured in Smash Ultimate are still alive to this day. This one's very self-explanatory. These are all the characters that one way or another pretty much die on screen, but for some strange magic or plot purposes, they got brought back from the dead. Let's start with an obvious and infamous example, Sonic. Do I need to elaborate much on him? Okay, so in Sonic 06, the best game of all time, Sonic just 
dies on screen. That's it. He gets shot by the main antagonist of that game and falls to the ground. So way later down the story, yeah, that happens. And with the power of true love, he gains consciousness and saves the world once again. Bowser is another prime example of this. He is straight up shown to be burnt alive in lava in New Super Mario Bros, only for Bowser Jr. to help him be brought back to life. Oh, and let's not mention the times he has really been shown that he died, only for him to just be resurrected or be back to life. That's sadly... I mean, fortunately, one of the few cases where a character in the Mario series is actually shown to be completely killed. Well, you can make the argument for how Luigi turns into a ghost in Simon and Ritter's trailer, and Mario gets absolutely murdered in Ridley's, those don't count since they're not in canonical games. Pit from Kid Icarus is another perfect example of cheating death, however. While it's stated that he's died many, and I mean many times in the underworld, so long Palutena is still alive and healthy, he's completely fine, since she can just bring him back to life. Now that's just cheating death if I've ever seen it. So, there has been one time in Uprising where in saving Dark Pit's life, he's lost his wings, ultimately, and actually, killing him. Even then, he's quickly brought back to life thanks to Dark Pit. Speaking of which, this same kind of logic applies to Dark Pit too, whereas he relies on Pit to still be alive. As for Palutena, while she is, in a sense, a goddess, we are shown that they can be severely hurt. With how you defeat several other gods like Pandora, Hades, and Medusa, it can still be possible that Palutena can actually die despite being a god. Either way, as of now, these three are safe from the Smash graveyard. Yikes, that sounded way darker than I thought. Sephiroth? Well, he's Sephiroth. Anyways, let's come back to once again a franchise that I have yet to play but made research only for this production, Xenoblade. Shulk is both a pretty simple but also weirdly complicated character to explain. So basically, later on in the story, it's revealed that in an expedition with a group including his parents, they were killed by this one being named Sansa. This one being a god who wants to awaken the Bionis. And those of you who are unaware, the Bionis is basically a giant mech that has remained dormant for thousands of years. It is also where the characters are located in and live. You see, I say all this because that one day in the expedition, when Shulk died, Sansa took over his body and in a way brought him back to life. Does this mean Shulk essentially cheated this? Yeah, actually. While he was pretty much possessed by an outside source, he still had his own motivation and feelings as seen in the storyline. Plus, even after Sansa leaves his body, he apparently comes back to life now? So, yeah, that happens. On the topic of Xenoblade, let's talk about Two's case. Long story short, we get introduced to these two, they combine their abilities and become one called Noma, who sacrifices themselves to defeat the big bad in the story, but it's shown that they are brought back to life as new entities with their memories intact. That alone, in my opinion, they at the very least cheated death. Sure, Hyra and Mithra don't have the same physical body they once had, but if their memories and personality are still the same, then I don't see any reason to not include them on this tier. Oh, Sora. So the best way to put it, there's been a few times where Sora has sacrificed himself and was ultimately brought back to life. Just to name one, for example, in Kingdom Hearts Final Mix, Sora essentially sacrifices his spirit and memories, which turns him into what's called a Heartless, only for later to be brought back to life thanks to Roxas. So yes, he cheated this, and I'd argue he cheated multiple, multiple times. But yeah, that's basically my entire list of Smash characters who canonically died. Thankfully, it's a very organized and easy to understand list, with no such thing as characters that I need to mention. This one's a little more different. You see, while we already confirmed who's really dead, or some god who cheated the inevitable, there's still a lot of characters who don't really have a concrete answer. So just in case, here are a few of them which I consider to be in the other category. First things first, let's talk about Inklings. As far as I'm aware, there's no true canonical character representing them in Smash, with the exception of Agent 3, meaning the Inklings who appear in Smash Ultimate can pretty much be any Inkling out in the bout. As for what they classify, they do seem to have the ability to cheat death, so long as they have a spawn point nearby. I like to think there's a certain radial distance with those things they can reach up to, so by any chance it isn't there? Yeah, you know what happens. Same logic with the character being more of a species slash thing than canonical character applies to all the Pokemon, Prana Plant, and Rob. And as for Steve, well, Steve's just built different guys. Hear me out. I'm willing to make a case that Steve is actually immortal. Get this, you know how every time you die in Minecraft you still have the option to come back to life? What if I told you that's the case for every difficulty except hardcore mode? Whereas if you die, you completely just leave the game. 
This is concrete proof that Steve is ultimately the most powerful being in existence, can absolutely destroy everyone and rule over the world until you change the difficulty. Steve is pretty much a god and is why he's one of the most broken characters in the game. And I think that's it for everyone who has died or is in the other category. Here's a little list I made for the Smash fans in here. This was honestly way harder than I thought, like oh my gosh. You have no idea how much research and having to understand the lore of these games was. I spent countless hours just trying to understand the Zelda timeline, let alone Xenoblade 1 and 2. So if I had to be honest, it was really enjoyable. I really wasn't expecting to be able to make this possible. So thank you for everyone watching till the end. Now if you excuse me, I will go continue a game that coincidentally embraces the understanding of death. This is Minty from Mint Joy Pictures.